Good morning, welcome to Sunday service at Ananda. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones and you can find the words to the chants and the songs for the Festival of Light uh, in the chair in front of you, in the back of the chair in front of you. Please rise for the opening prayer. voice of God calls to us to awaken in him. How will he find us when he comes? Awake and ready. And when he asks us to dedicate ourselves to him ever more perfectly, how will he find us? Awake and ready. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Paramahansa Yoganandaji, Saints of East and West, we invoke your joyful presence. Divine Mother, in the forest thou art peace. In the river thou art vitality. In the mountain thou art majesty. In the ocean thou art vast. In human hearts thou art purity. In our minds wisdom. And in the saints you have incarnated. As friend and guide. Help us to receive thee, that we may become like thee, self-realized, in divine bliss, for we are ever yours. Om. Peace. Amen. Let's take our seats and have some music by our founder, Swami Kriyananda. singing a children's song today, and you have an opportunity to join us the third time through. <clears throat> and I will face you and do this. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second verse I'll do. These are your clappings. And some of you are multi-talented and will sing and clap. Yeah. <laughs> but others of you, clapping is enough. So we'll give this a try. Joy to you. <laughs> Chanting. Bring it a little back in the spine. <laughs> the first chant is on page 26. What lightning flash? Like 
to Sunday school. The next chant is on page 14. The theme today is soul receptivity. And this chant, Door of My Heart, is the quality of an open heart that we seek. Door of my heart, open my heart for thee. Door of my heart, open my heart for thee. Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once come to me. Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once have a few minutes of meditation together. Let's sit upright, chest up and shoulders down and palms upward on the thighs, sitting closer to the edge of the chair, the spine achieving its natural curvature, the body relaxed but wakeful. First open the doors of the heart, for where there is peace in the heart, the mind is clear and perceptive. Dive deep into the quiet, calm heart where you are free and secure. Nothing and no one can harm you, for God lives in the temple of the heart. Feel Divine Mother's presence there as natural love. It is without condition. It is forever. It is yours. that great river of peace. Uplift, come take this river, lift it up through the center of the body to the point between the eyebrows, there uniting the river of feeling with the flow of grace and light and wisdom and thereby transcend and ascend to an angel of the Lord, for we are children of the infinite light. There become as one. Rest in this light and in this love, which is who we truly are.
Let us meditate in silence now for just a few minutes. Remaining in the meditative position and consciousness, let's listen to this quality, these words on the subject of work. Work should be done with a creative attitude, never for the sake of selfish gain, but for the chance it gives to us to help create a better world. Those who work with the thought of pay live in the future. They lose the habit of living here and now, where alone true happiness can be found. Work should always be done as well as possible, not out of self-conceit, but in gratitude for the free gift of life, of sunshine, of water, of air, and in gratitude simply for our God-given power to be useful to our fellow man. Let's affirm together, I will do my work thinking of thee, Lord, I offer to thee the very best that is in me. I offer to thee the very best that is in me. I will do my work thinking of thee, Lord. I will do my work thinking of thee. I offer to thee the very best that is in me. Whispering to the subconscious mind now. Now affirm only silently, but with deep concentration at the point between the eyebrows. Feel these words as coming, as it were, from your own soul. I will do my work, thinking of thee, Lord. I offer to thee the very best that is in me. Beloved Lord, who so wonderfully created the high snowy mountains, the bounding rivers, the colorful fragrant flowers, the vast heaving oceans, and the distant glittering stars, manifest through me thy perfect joy. Let's have today's reading. The following reading is from Rays of the One Light, weekly commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita. Truth is one and eternal. Realize one it. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Chapter 1 of the Gospel of St. John states, But as many as received him, to them gave he, he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. That was a passage Paramahansa Yogananda often quoted to his disciples. Be in tune, he would tell them. Delusion can't touch you if you will keep in tune. A few of you will fall, he said once, 
but it needn't be if you would stay in tune. Of a disciple who became highly advanced, even though she didn't meditate much, he said, she got there by attunement. To one who found meditation difficult, he said, I will meditate for you, so long as you stay in tune. Truth is a state of consciousness, not a well-worded definition. It is that consciousness, above all, that our lives are transformed. Therefore, the Bhagavad Gita says, in the 10th chapter, to those who are ever attached to me and who worship me with love, I impart discernment by means of which they attain me. Out of my love for them, I, the divine within them, set alight in them the radiant lamp of wisdom, thereby dispelling the darkness of their ignorance. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Good morning. You think it's springtime or something. <laughs> Hope the flowers don't get fooled out there, but I think it's happening. Well, I, uh, as a hazard of my occupation, occasionally people send me jokes. <laughs> and uh, recently I've gotten a few good ones. There was this one about a little boy who said to his father, I know what the Bible means. And the father said, you what? <laughs> he said, I know what the Bible means. And the father said, OK, what does the Bible mean? And the little boy said, basic information before you leave Earth. <laughs> That's old enough to know acronyms. <laughs> Anyway, having just spoken about the Bible, I, will, I actually wanted to start this morning to look at one little phrase in the Bhagavad Gita reading. This is Krishna speaking on God's behalf. He says, to those who are ever attached to me and who worship me with love, I impart discernment by means of which they attain me. When you meditate on those words, they're basically the entire spiritual path. He says, to those who are ever attached to me, meaning concentrating on me completely, one-pointedly, and who worship me with love, the essential key of love, the ingredient that draws us to God's love. God is love. I impart discernment. Now that part is interesting because I want to just touch on for a moment the difference between judgment and discernment. In judgment, we inject our opinion, our like and our dislike. We compare. He is nice. He is not nice. Um, this is beautiful. This is not beautiful. It has a, a quality of uh, like or attachment associated with it. Whereas with discernment, we're just looking at two different things for what they are. This is black, this is white. It's not, I like black, I like white, I don't like white. I, you know, it's just only the observation. And it takes discernment to, well, I should say with the gift that we get of discernment once we're concentrated on God with all our heart, with that gift of discernment, we begin to see in our lives those things that draw us closer to God and those things that pull us away from God remembrance 
into ego activity. And so by this growing gift of concernment, discernment, the more we concentrate and the more we love God, step by step, we find ourselves being drawn closer to that divine awareness, to that greater awareness of our own divinity. And he says, and by this, by means of which they attain me, it takes that discernment to be able to, in time, come closer to the awareness of our own divinity that is within us. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful concept. I, um, I was look, reading recently um, with one of our study groups, Sister Gyanamata's book, God Alone. Sister Gyanamata was Yogananda's foremost <coughs> woman disciple. And she talked about the fact that whenever she was in Yogananda's presence, Yogananda was her guru, and it's Yogananda's teachings that we practice here at Ananda. Whenever she was in his presence, she would find herself filled with an inner stillness. She said this was not a posture she took because that's how you're supposed to be around your guru. It was just a natural inner stillness that would come within her. And then what would happen is whatever was going on in the room, if it was a meeting or a satsang, small group, large group, whatever it was, the words and the vibration of the words and the meaning of the words that he was expressing would fall clearly on her heart and she would receive more of a deeper understanding because her heart was still. And she said sometimes it would come that moment or within hours or days or weeks or sometimes years. She would reflect back on words he said or, or things that he did or the glance of an eye or an expression on the face. And she would have a deeper understanding of some aspect of the spiritual life. And I know for myself, I had a, a sort of a, a faint echo of this in my own working through the years with Swami Kriyananda, Ananda's founder and Yogananda's disciple. He was by self-definition, not fully realized, but he was a greatly advanced spiritual soul. I certainly recognized him as much more advanced than myself. And I found the same kind of thing happening when I was in his presence, whether it was with small groups or by myself or with large groups of people. But I learned it the hard way, or not the hard way, I learned it by observation because when I wasn't directly involved in the conversation, when I wasn't the object of the conversation, and I was just observing him interacting with someone else, I would see all too often, he would, he would give a hint at something, and they were so busy expressing their own opinions about things that they would miss it. And I would go, oh. There, but for the grace of God, go I. You know, I don't want to do that. So I made it a practice to listen, to practice the art of listening when I was in any kind of interaction with him. And again, I found similarly that sometimes I wouldn't get it in that moment, but to this day and probably into the future, I reflect back on different situations and I go, oh my gosh, that's what he meant by that. That's how that works. And so receptivity is getting still and being open, not so open <laughs> that our brains fall out, but open to begin to discern and take into our lives and act on whatever the intuition or guidance may be. Now it's tricky because sometimes we have to be creative with it. We are on this plane because we are still in ego. 
that's, you know, that's a given for all of us. And so we have those likes and dislikes. And I was thinking about an example of this might be if, let's say I'm, uh, I'm really low in iron and I'm weakened by it. And it's suggested to, be by someone, to me by someone wiser than myself to uh, eat a lot of spinach. But let's say I don't like spinach. <laughs> I don't really want to eat spinach. So I resist that thought, or I can resist that thought and push it away and rationalize it and try to figure out something else. Or I can say, OK, I'll pick up some cookbook. And maybe there's some recipes that camouflage spinach and taste really good. Or maybe there's some way that I can do this without um, having to taste it, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And so receptivity is the, the willingness to creatively engage in whatever it is of the guidance or the intuition that we're receiving. I remember when um, I was coordinating the publishing, or I was asked to coordinate the publishing um, for Swamiji's books, Swami Kriyananda, and I had no experience with it whatsoever. So I went and researched, you know, and talked to different people in the industry, how do you sell books? And in that day, this was the mid-'80s, the big thing was to get your books into the chains. And um, I was sort of at a loss. You had to have representatives, and they, you know, your books had to be selling fairly well or have the potential to sell well to be able to make it into a chain to begin with. So I went to Swami Kriyananda, and I told him what I had found out. And, and he didn't really respond, you know, react to it. But somewhere in the conversation, he said, you know, what happened with Yogananda's autobiography of a yogi, he said his foremost disciple, Rajasi Janakananda, made a special donation large enough just to send some of the monks out on the road into the bookstores to sell the books directly. And then the conversation went on into other things. You know, when I came home and I was reflecting on it, and I thought, well, if it worked for the autobiography, <laughs> maybe this is something we should try. So he never said, you should do this. But he you know, just offered it as a thought. And at that time, he was going out on tour, and somebody had donated a motorhome for him to go on a lecture tour. So when he came back from the lecture tour, I asked him if we could use it and send some of our folks out on the road to the bookstores. And we did. And one thing led to another. We'd have two people go out for a month. And from the office, we'd book all their appointments, and six a day minimum. And they would make their way to a few states. And then we would fly out another two people. And the first two would come home. And they would go to the next place. We had a lot of fun with it, and it was, people had a good time. We opened up over 2,000 bookstore accounts. We made real good connections along the way with all these different people. Now, that's not happening anymore these days. A lot of bookstores have closed down, I'll grant you. But back then, it really worked. And when I would tell my colleagues in the publishing world about what we were doing, they were jealous because we had the manpower and the resources to do it. But again, it was acting on an inspiration and then just, just being creative with it and just moving forward with it. My ways are not your ways, says the Lord. Even if the world tells you it's not going to work, why not? Anything can happen in God. I had a similar thing where at one of the US trade shows that I went to, and this was like in 86, I think, there was an Indian publisher who approached me there and who wanted to make a contract to publish Swami Kriyananda's autobiography, The New Path, into, you know, in India. 
And I said, well, let me look into it. I had no idea how to do anything like that. And then he said, well, I'm going to be at the Frankfurt Book Fair in October. Will you be there? Maybe we could finalize it there. This was before emails and even before fax and any of that. So you had to sort of meet in person or, or talk on very long distance, expensive calls to do this stuff. Anyway, I said, OK, yeah, let me look into it. I had no idea. And I came back, and I downloaded with Kriyananda about everything about the book fair and told him about this situation. And he said, wouldn't that be lovely? And it just sort of moved on. And I thought, OK, that's a yes. <laughs> and I booked my ticket, and I, I made arrangements to be able to display at the show and have a booth. And I thought, OK, I'll look into how to do this. I'll call literary agents in New York. And maybe some of them will tell me how you negotiate a contract, and what interest, and what advances, and how does it work. And I had no idea, no perspective whatsoever. So I call these literary agents in New York, like a dozen of them. And I come to find out these are like trade secrets, and nobody wants to tell you <laughs> how they do it. You know, so I couldn't get anything out of anyone. And by this time, it was time to go to Frankfurt. So I'm there, and I still have no idea what I'm going to say to this man or anyone else who approaches me there, because it's all about international rights contracts. Setting up the booth, and on the setup day, the day before it opens up, and I see across the way in the Bantam uh, booth, they're setting up, all these German guys are setting up their display. But I see this guy who's dressed a little better. He looks like he might be in the, with Bantam Publishing. And I thought, OK. So I go over to him, and I said, I just laid my cards on the table. I said, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm meeting with this man tomorrow from India. He wants a contract. I have no idea what's in a contract, what you know, how royalties work, how any of this works. And he said, OK. He said, come with me. And only the big book uh, displays had their own little offices in the back. He even had a copy machine. Turns out he was their copyright lawyer. <laughs> Real friendly guy, walks me into the back, makes a copy of his 25-page contract, just blackens out just the names so that you know I couldn't see who it was with. But there was everything that I needed, and he said I could have it. <laughs> he just handed it to me. It had all the terms. It had all the language. It had everything. Okay, It was amazing. And that was the beginning of building on the foreign rights. Within some years, we were in 33 languages with our books. We had, I think I personally have made close to 1,000 contracts in the foreign rights. And it all came from nothing, because you just act on that inspiration. You just act on that faith. You know, this world is a world of actors. And everybody thinks they're professional this and they're professional that. But you know, it's all learnable, and it's all doable, and it's all God's play. And why can't you be an actor in that play? Of course you can, when that inspiration comes, and when you listen for it, and then move forward step by step. Swami Kriyananda tells of the time that he went through a period when he lived with Yogananda when he kept saying the words, teach me to love you as you love me. Teach me to love you as you love me. He would say it silently, mentally, to himself, constantly. It was what we call in India the japa, or practicing the presence of God. And then after some months, he was with Yogananda in a room with others. And Yogananda then looked at him, and he said, how can the little cup hold the entire ocean. You must first expand the cup. And that's sort of the next level of receptivity 
You see, we, we hold up the cup. In this case, it's the cup of our ego to God. But it's full of itself, right? So we have to make room for God's grace to begin with, to be able to come into it. And it has to be turned up. So I like to think of it as just sort of putting all the stuff from the ego sideways into a box. It's on hold. There it is. And then you put the cup there. And God's grace can start to flow in. That ego is still over there. If you need it again, you can, you know, all those qualities, you can take it back. But basically, it just becomes sort of a refined shell, and God's grace can flow into it. And it, there's so much room, and it flows in such abundance that it begins to overflow. And the cup melts away into that infinity. And so that's the grace that we seek to receive. That's the ego that needs to step aside just enough to allow that grace to come in. And that's the stillness in which we can hear that inner voice. And that's the courage to act on it. Let's, <clears throat> let's listen to these words from Yogananda's collection of prayer demands, the book he calls Whispers from Eternity. <clears throat> Volumes of thy Savior voice resound through the loudspeaker of every loving heart. The voice of thy wisdom roams through the ether of space, seeking everywhere hearts that are tuned to ecstasy. Sadly, thy warning sermons pass unheard by souls deafened by the static of sense pleasures. O divine broadcaster, tune our souls, long distracted by the static of our indifference. Fine tune us with the delicate touch of soul perception. Grant us the privilege of hearing thy magic melodies in the ecstasy of divine awakening. Now we'd like to provide an opportunity to make a contribution. Please take what you'd like to offer and hold it in your right hand. Pray with me. Divine Mother, Divine Mother we offer thee the fruits of our labors. We offer thee the fruits of our labors. Bless this offering. Bless this offering. Let it serve as a channel of thy light. Let it serve as a channel of thy light. For truth seekers everywhere. Truth seekers everywhere. Om. sing a um, one of the Ugandans whispers from eternity God 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 from the depths of slumber as I ascend the spiral stairways of wakefulness I will whisper, whisper, God, God, God. Thou art the food, and when I break my fast of nightly separation from thee, I will taste thee and mentally say, God, God, God. No matter where I go, the spotlight of my mind will ever keep turning on me. And in the battle din of activity, my silent war cry will be God, 
God, God. When boisterous storms of trial shriek, and when worries howl at me, I will drown their noises, loudly chanting, God, God, God. When my mind weaves dreams, 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 with threads of memories, then on that magic cloth will I emboss God, God, God. Every night in time of deepest sleep, when my peace dreams and calls joy, 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 my joy comes singing evermore, God, God, God. In waking, eating, working, dreaming, sleeping, serving, meditating, chanting, divinely loving, my soul will constantly hum, unheard by any God, 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 God. Thank you, Susan. Uh, when you go out uh, this morning, you'll have an opportunity to pick up a bulletin. And there are listed here all of the things that are happening at Ananda in the next couple of weeks. So be sure and take one. But I wanted to point out a few things. We have our next international dinner coming up on the 28th of February. and. <laughs> Uh, this one will be an Asian theme, and our chefs are Vaughn Barker and Joanne Takasagawa. So you know that it will be wonderful. And in addition to great food and great company and a good time, it also helps us raise money for our fellowship hall. And so this time next year, we can have the international dinner in the fellowship hall. So you can make your reservations downstairs. We do need prepaid reservations for this for these dinners. We also have meditation teacher training starting this month, so if you're interested in that, let us know. It's a great way. Not only can you learn to teach others to meditate, but also deepen your own meditation. And uh, Jamina and Lynn are teaching the class Love Without Fear, and it started last week, but this is one that you can come to uh, a single class or two classes, so you can join them Tuesday night here this week and next week for a class on love without fear. We'll have the Festival of Light now, the ceremony written by Swami Kriyananda. Let us lift up our hearts in a festival of light. The essence of this ceremony has been passed down from ancient times. O oh, waves that we are on the bosom of the infinite sea, joyfully together let us celebrate our own greater reality. For now, by God's grace, our redemption is at hand. The promise has been given. The divine light returning anew to earth has given us power, as the Holy Bible proclaims, to become the sons of God. Into our hands have been delivered 
the sacred keys of awakening, abundant now is our hope. The Lord through the Bhagavad Gita promised, even the worst of sinners, by steadfast meditation on me, speedily comes to me. Again in that holy scripture he declared, even a little practice of this inward religion will free one from dire fears and colossal sufferings. And whereas suffering and sorrow in the past were the coin of man's redemption, for us now the payment has been exchanged for calm acceptance and joy. Thus may we understand that pain is the fruit of self-love, whereas joy is the fruit of love for God from sun and moon and all the stars, from glistening seas, high mountains, desert solitudes, and vast, fruitful plains, and from the hearts of mankind and of creatures everywhere, goes up in wordless yearning a prayer for redemption. Please stand and repeat after me. Almighty source of all that is, Almighty source of all that is. From sorrow lead us to everlasting joy. From sorrow lead us to everlasting joy. From darkness lead us to infinite light. From darkness lead us to infinite light. From death lead us to immortality. From death lead us to immortality. O peace. Amen. Please be seated. A fledgling bird once flew out into the world, gained strength and wisdom, its parents told it, and what you acquire, share with others, even as we have shared with you. For you are a part of all that is. Thus, Lord, we left you countless eons ago. Ours was a holy mission. You charged us to learn great lessons from life, to be fruitful in the gifts you had given us, to expand and multiply them. Alas, we abandoned our mission. Instead, we hoarded selfishly. Nor did wisdom come to us when repeatedly we lost everything we had. For the young bird in flight for the first time gloried in its newfound strength. It began to think how foolish I would be to share my strength with anyone. What else is wisdom if not to keep what is mine for myself? And so we, like that bird, entered upon the second stage of the soul's long journey away from its home in God, the stage which is called the revolt. That bird's brief day was like eons of our time. When afternoon came, it entered a storm cloud and soon found itself struggling for its life. Wind and rain lashed at its wings. The more it fought back, the weaker it became. Give yourself into my hands, cried the wind. To your strength, I can then add my own. At last the little bird heeded this counsel. Then suddenly it found itself soaring joyously high above the clouds. Hours passed and night fell. The little bird grew afraid. How, it cried, can I fly in this darkness? And the night whispered, fear not, for lo, peace awaits you in the unknown. Surrender to me and your strength will be renewed. And after a time, the tiny rebel surrendered and found the night's counsel true. And rain and sky and grassy fields all sang, Behold, your very strength to fly has never been your own. Look to the source of all power if you would conquer fear and weakness. And the bird asked, Where can I find that source? And they answered, Seek it in the farthest depths of being, in your own self. Thus, gradually, the bird entered that third stage of the journey, which is called the quest. And we now, like that little bird, have come to realize that buffeting winds are life's way of giving us strength and courage, that even fear, like shadows on a statue, gives light and substance to hope. From the depths of unknowing, Lord, we cry out to thee, is there no lasting purpose to our lives? Behold, all that we thought was light was but darkness. Who are we in reality? For what end were we made? Ever and again, through your awakened sons, the answer comes. 
the forming of stars and moons and planets, of galaxies revolving on the tides of space, of upheaving mountains, snowy wastes, and dark, silent ocean deeps, had but this for its design, the birth of life, and with life's birth the dawn of self-awareness passage through dim corridors of waking consciousness to emerge at last into infinite peace, into perfect joy. O children of light, forsake the darkness. Please stand. Know that forever you and he are one. Raise your hands and chanting Om. Ask that the power of God replenish you in body, mind, and soul. Om. Gaze upon this light as a symbol of God's love. A prayer of love went up from earth, and you responded. A ray of your light flashed out from the heart of infinity, burst downward through night skies of consciousness, and was born on earth for the redemption of mankind in human form. Many times has that light descended drawn to earth by the call of aspiring love. Your chosen people have always been those of every race and nation who with deep love chose thee. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, Lord, with all my heart, with all my, heart, with all my mind, with all my mind with all my soul, with all my soul, and with all my strength, and with all my strength, I choose thy love. I choose thy love. I choose only thee. I choose only thee. The infinite Christ consciousness, the only begotten, has come down anew to earth for the salvation of mankind. When we need you, Lord, our beloved, you descend. Our human griefs your love alone can mend. By proud indifference unaffected, though eternally rejected, you remain our friend. Oh, to face your love. Bless our emptiness, it grow. Now at last our hearts we give you, who remain our friend. Long we fear to face your love. Bless our emptiness, 
I in the Himalaya, eyes filled with divine love, Jesus appeared to the great master, Babaji. The lights on the high altar of my church, he said, have been growing dim, though still lit on lower altars of good works. The noble taper of inner communion with the Lord burns low and is ill-attended. Let us together, united in Christ's love, set lights ablaze on that high altar once again. Thus, a new ray of light was sent to earth through the great masters of this path. Greater can no love be than this, from a life of infinite joy and freedom in God, willingly to embrace limitation, pain, and death for the salvation of mankind. Such ever has been the sacrifice of the great masters for the world. Here, then, is the fourth and last stage of the soul's long journey through time and space, the redemption. Lord, we offer up the little light that is in us into thy blazing light of infinity. Grant us the grace to know thee and make us ever increasingly pure channels of thy love to all. Please stand. celebrate the grace of God that has come anew to earth through our line of gurus, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and Paramahansa Yogananda. This grace is eternally channeled to mankind by great masters in every religion. It has been given new clothing by our gurus to reflect man's dawning awareness that matter is only a manifestation of divine energy. In God, all are equal, not only Jesus Christ, Lord Krishna, and great saints everywhere, but even in essence, those on earth who have sinned most greatly. Joyfully lifting up our hearts in song, we pray that we who earnestly seek communion with your light receive it in our lives abundantly. who feel so inclined to come up to the altar and receive the touch of light from the masters. As you approach, offer a prayer of gratitude to the infinite Christ in whose love our line of masters have descended that we might all come to God. Pray too for the grace to share with all as you have received, for you are a part of all that is. 
May the light of Christ, the infinite consciousness, shine upon you. moment of silence. Now let us stand and send out to all the world the blessings we've received.
Heavenly Father, Father, Divine Mother, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and beloved Master, and beloved Master, Paramahansa Yogananda, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow at your feet, humbly we bow at your feet, O Divine Mother, O Divine Mother, help me to still my heart. Help me to still my heart, to still my mind, to still my mind, to hear thy voice, to hear thy voice, to see thy reflection, to see thy reflection, by my efforts, by my efforts, and by your grace, and by your grace, lift me, lift me into your love, into your love. Om Shanti. Amen. Amen. Go out with joy.